that you've joined us bright and early on this Monday morning to hopefully be inspired by Neil Hayward, Chief People Officer at HS2, and Steve Frost, who's the CEO and founder here at WorkBuzz. And I'm your hostess with the most desk today. My name is Dawn Smedley. Yeah. I'm Enterprise Client Lead at WorkBuzz and have the privilege of working with lots of our clients on improving the employee experience as well. Um, so we'll get cracking. But today, just to make sure you're in the right place, we are talking about how Neil's helped HS2 reinvent the employee experience. So hopefully you're in the right place and let's get cracking. So just a few introductions to start with. Um, our VIP today really is Neil. Um, so Neil's got a proven track record as a board level executive and human resource human resources professional across multiple sectors, both public and private, as well as internationally, so you're in safe hands. Before joining HS2, Neil was working as an independent management consultant, and his most recent corporate role was at the post office, where as group people director, he was part of the team that restored this business to profit after several years of significant losses. Neil had previously held senior level HR positions at BT, the Ministry of Justice, Standard Chartered Bank and Circo Group amongst others uh, and is now, as we know, the Chief People Officer at HS2, a member of the executive team and responsible for ensuring that HS2 has the capa capability and capacity needed to build the UK's largest ever infrastructure project. So hopefully, hopefully there'll be some learnings um, about the HS2 project, which I took from this personally when Neil presented at Workbus Live the other week as well. So we're really, really pleased to have you on board today, Neil. And then joining Neil, we've got our great leader, Steve Frost, <laughs> CEO and founder of WorkBuzz. So WorkBuzz is an employee experience platform. We help um, organizations gather real-time feedback. And Steve likes to think of us as HR's secret weapon for managing change better and adapting to a changing world of work, which I think it's fair to say we've needed more than ever in the last 18 months. Um, but in 2019 and 2020, Steve was named in the top 101 employee engagement global influencers. So again, you're in safe hands, um, whether they're, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> what I always like to start our webinars with is um, some random facts about our hosts as well, just to show you that they're real humans. And did you know that Neil is actually one part of a set of twins. So we're just hoping that we've got the right one here today, otherwise it might be a bit of a random presentation. <laughs> um, and then Steve, he's a Man United fan, don't judge him. Um, and actually he has a, a bit of a tendency to sing very badly in the office along to the killers, Mr. Brightside. So a couple of insights on our speakers today. Hopefully we won't have any random singing from Steve, but you never know. <laughs> so we will crack on. Um, thank you for joining us. A couple of housekeeping bits. The webinar is being recorded, so a copy will be emailed to you after the event and feel free to share with colleagues. If you've got any questions during the web webinar, please email it to hello at workbuzz.com and my lovely colleague Rebecca will field those questions through to us. And if we've got time at the end, then we'll answer those. Otherwise, we will respond in our follow up with the answers to those questions as well. I could bid a little bit of this off in Steve's introduction, but WorkBuzz is an employee listening platform. We help you gather real-time feedback from your people to improve employee engagement and retain your best talent. We're super proud to work with some amazing brands, including HS2. And you know what makes us really proud is kind of listening to those stories and seeing the difference that we make in terms of impact. And Neil will be bringing some of that to life today, but we work across all sectors. So hopefully we've experienced most of the challenges that everyone on the phone is facing today uh, and we'll bring that to the conversation as well. So what to expect? Really to start with I'm going to show a quick video actually of HS2's journey and what the challenges are building Britain's new high-speed railway. The challenges Neil's faced as HR director there, how, we re how they invented the employee experience and HS2's results and achievements. Um, I think what's really great about the way that Neil presents is that it's really down to earth. It's not preachy at all. It's the warts and all version of Neil's story. And I think that's what makes it really powerful. And then there'll just be some final thoughts and reflections from Neil and Steve on the journey that they've been on and kind of how workers have helped that as well. Um, so onwards, we'll start with the video. So hopefully the sound will work. 
More of us than ever are using the railway in Britain. Demand for rail travel has more than doubled in the past 20 years, and passenger numbers continue to grow. Our busy rail network serves a complex mix of fast, slow, non-stop and stopping trains. This means that we aren't able to run services close together to get the most out of the existing network. Lots of different trains are competing for a limited amount of space, and as trains can't overtake on a double-track railway, this leads to unreliability, delays, and overcrowding. Despite a decade of upgrades on the current network, demand is still increasing, and even the upgraded parts of our network are running at or near to the limits of capacity. Further upgrades to current lines would deliver a fraction of the capacity of a new railway line and often cause significant disruption for passengers and line-side communities. Britain's new high-speed railway, High Speed 2, is a game-changer for our rail network and will improve your journey, even if you don't use our trains. Building HS2 frees up a massive amount of space on the existing railway by placing high-speed services on their own pair of tracks. Once HS2 is operating, services on existing lines can run much closer together, meaning, for example, there can be more rush-hour trains. There will also be flexibility to meet growing passenger demands in the future. HS2 will also relieve pressure on key bottlenecks, such as where branch lines meet with long-distance routes or at larger stations. By creating more space for more trains, we will also take hundreds of thousands of lorries off the road every year as more freight can move to rail. This will make our motorways safer, improve air quality and help reduce carbon emissions. All this adds up to more train services across the country, more seats for passengers and fewer delays. Over to you, Neil. Thanks, thanks, Dawn. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's really nice to be on a, a webinar with the glorious leader. There's a sort of tone of North Korea about that, which I'm sure is entirely uh, unintended. But um, look, uh, my organisation's been partnering with WorkBuzz now for about two and a half years, and, and today's just the story of that partnership and what's happened. Um, I'm not one of those HR directors who who tries to create with hindsight uh, the march of progress to an inevitable outcome. Uh, we didn't set out to reinvent employee experience, but along the way we've done so. And I think that's probably the first point that I want to make clear to you uh, today. So I'm not going to say that everything was thought through in advance and then we've delivered it. What I am going to say is choosing a great partner work bars has enabled us to get to outcomes that we didn't originally envisage and see, which are proving incredibly beneficial to our business. Uh, this slide just captures where we are now. You've got the, the video that told you why HS2 is being built, but actually this is now a, a live construction project. There are 300 active sites between London and Birmingham uh, alone. Legislation has happened to enable Birmingham to crew to, to be planned and built, and we're awaiting uh, what else the government will eventually ask us to do. But these 300 active sites have more than 21,000 people working at them. And I'm the HR director for HS2 Limited, which has about 2,000 people. Our job is to act as the client overseeing the supply chain partners that we've selected to build this railway for us. And my job has been around ensuring that HS2 Limited had the capability, capacity and culture to ensure that we could fulfill our client responsibilities properly uh, and also to make sure that our supply chain were delivering what they were contracted to, to do. And how we treat people and the importance of people has become more and more fundamental to the journey that we've been on over the last four years. And I was appointed HR director back in November 2017, so broadly four years ago. Let's move on to the next slide. It will be worth it. Um, so you'd imagine that with a project of this size and scale, 
uh, that when I joined four years ago, uh, I'm, and I was joining an organisation that had been in some form of existence for about eight or nine years, we would be um, healthily set up for the challenge of letting contracts and supervising the beginning of construction and and and. But it it just wasn't like that. Um, the point that I that I joined uh, back in uh, 2017. To say the least, we had a mixed reputation as an organisation um, um, and nor was the government as committed as one might have imagined with hindsight to to building HS2. In fact, that commitment only came finally in April 2020 with what was called notice to proceed. That's when the government irrevocably uh, committed to the fact that London to Birmingham would be built. So back in 2017, um, we were in a very different uh, state for a variety of reasons. Um, we had a mixed reputation. There was a perception that the program had creeping costs, that there had been a lack of stability at the executive team level, that the organisation had not always been honest with stakeholders, including government, around the maturity of the program design that was having an impact on what it would cost. Turnover was very high inside the organisation and motivation and levels of engagement insofar as they had been assessed were low. And the HR function was a kind of microcosm of the organisation uh, as a whole, um, because um, I was the fourth HR director in a year. And believe me, stability of leadership is the start point for any form of engagement, isn't it? And if, you've, and if you're the fourth HR director in the year, it does suggest that some things gone cataclysmically wrong because nobody nobody experiences that sort of churn without there being good reasons. So um, it wasn't a good situation that I that I came into. And I'm going to try and give you now the story of what changed between then and now and how we've done some things right and also stumbled upon the right things in other areas. So next slide, please. Um, our first step was um, there was no clear strategic direction for the organisation from a kind of people and organisation perspective. Um, and therefore, this was the document that the board signed off um, after I'd been in the business about six months, and it set the, uh, the strategic direction for the function and for the organisation. So this was the first point at which the idea of getting the capability, capacity and culture right was framed. So in effect, within six months, I'd signed off at a board level um, a strategy for uh, the organisation. Um, the important point to note here was that um, without that, um, we would have had nothing to anchor all of the work that we subsequently did. So we talked about um, making sure that we we had the right talent and, the, and an inclusive culture. Uh, we talked about um, leaving a skills legacy behind us, so beyond the railway. We talked about HR being an effective service provider to the organisation, and we talked about capacity and culture. So this is the, the first step. My suggestion to you is that if you've not framed employee experience as something that's an outcome of delivering uh, your people strategy inside your organisation, um, there's always a difficulty in getting a board level and executive level connection and support. So there has to be some strategic intent behind what you're trying to do in your organisations. And this was our first step. Next slide, please. And here's that uh, strategy laid out. Um, you can see a couple of things about HS2 that would strike you as unusual. I mean, I'm not sure how your organisations choose to define and measure their success, but seven strategic goals for any organisation, some of which are not mutually complementary and indeed may be contradictory, is always a, a challenge. And you can see that we're, we're there to provide uh, value for money in building the railway. Well, we've got to ensure that that railway has a great customer experience and that we don't disrupt uh, society around us as we're building, building it. We're supposed to leave a legacy in terms of uh, jobs and, and skills. We have to make sure we build the railway to the highest possible health and safety standards. We have to be a good neighbour and uh, so on. Anyway, um, complexity is there and the strategy objectives were designed to ensure that I created some focus for the organisation as a whole in realising those strategic goals. I think the key thing that you should note back here in early 2018 is that you can't see the words employee experience specifically referenced, but you can see things that are outcomes or measures of employee experience. So a high performing and engaged workforce, an inclusive organisation. I wasn't thinking about employee experience in the way that I might be thinking about it now back in 2018, but I was thinking about what an inclusive organisation would look like and what impact an inclusive organisation would have 
on uh, achieving the strategic goals. Next slide, please. Um, so we contracted with WorkBuzz um, towards the end of 2018, coming into 2019. Uh, HS2 had been a very traditional, typical organisation in the employee consultation, employee engagement space. Uh, you may be working for one of those organisations still, but we ran a, a survey uh, perhaps once a year um, and uh, not much more frequently than that. It was seen very much as a sort of HR exercise. Um, HR was responsible for anything that the organization didn't like uh, and line managers were responsible for everything that the organization did have good did have did have uh, established that was that was liked and and then so a kind of a kind of um, not very helpful and really quite disconnected uh, temperature check. My own view in uh, in deciding to work with work bars was that I could not engage with uh, a specialist engagement uh, provider, survey provider and advisor until I put a lot of the fundamentals right. So you can imagine that I spent most of 2018 and 2019 reinventing what HR is and does in order to fill that strategy. And at the point where I felt we were getting some traction and that, it, and that the atmosphere in the business was starting to change, that was the point at which I thought it would be useful to start surveying staff to check that we were on the right lines and on the right track. And I worked with WorkBuzz to try and define um, a survey uh, that would capture um, a number of things. The first thing, uh, what a world class experience would look like, uh, a core link to the values that we had established, concentrating on the kind of engage for success uh, agenda, um, a basis for creating a, a very effective employee voice. And what I liked about WorkBuzz was the agile real time data collection and information uh, that they that they gave me and their flexibility and adaptability. And I got quite excited about the fact that whereas my normal HR scorecard um, always presented what had happened last month, last quarter, here I would be able to present uh, real time information and I'd be able to drill down into that information um, in almost any cut of the data that I would uh, that I would like to, to see both the good points and the bad points, the dark corners, the light and shade within the organization. Um, and to be honest with you, we were coming from a low base. Uh, the 2018 survey, um, we were about 57 percent engaged. If you work in the broader public sector and in central government, that will seem like an impossibly high mountain to climb. But if you work in the private sector, that wouldn't be a particularly challenging uh, start point that was seen like a very, very uh, low base. So we set to work with WorkBuzz and we're all ready to go with our new survey approach when? Next slide. Well, um, what happened was the thing that none of us anticipated or expected or understood. You may recall that in the early part of uh, 2020, um, there was noise coming out of Asia about the fact that this some some form of weird Asian flu was spreading across the world from the end of November 19 onwards. And I was one of those HR directors who demonstrated an incredible degree of foresight and prescience by saying it's just another winter flu epidemic. It'll all blow over. And then, of course, it didn't. So we were about to launch our our main engagement survey and we went into lockdown. Um, you may recall exactly what that felt like at the time. I found myself appointed to another job I, as well as being chief people officer. I became chief pandemic officer. Uh, I um, was responsible for running our gold command, as we called it, the incident management response. Uh, we imagined it would be temporary for a few weeks. Actually, I was still running it until uh, until this month. So 18 months of of endeavour and effort managing our response to the pandemic. and. Here's what I really like about the work bus uh, uh, situation. We were all set to go with an approach to engagement and we pivoted and changed the whole thing within a matter of days to launch a, a remote well-being pulse. So actually we we changed our intent, we changed the questionnaire, we changed the timetable uh, and we were ready to go within a matter of days of running a different survey tool and approach altogether. Now, that requires two things to be true of your organization and your supplier. It requires the supplier to have the willingness to pivot quickly, the flexibility, adaptability, the culture and mindset. And it also requires you as the client organization to be able to get out of your own way and change your mind quickly. 
I would say that doing this in a normal pre-lockdown environment, it might have taken me something like six weeks to get approval to change this survey rather than a matter of days. But, but I was lucky. I was both chief people officer and chief pandemic officer, and I had been given the sort of powers that the glorious leader in work bar <laughs> had in order to make something happen quite quickly. So um, we launched a remote pulse within a matter of days, four days, and we were focusing on making sure that we were setting our people up uh, at home properly, that they were that we had real time feedback around how they were thinking and feeling about our approach to getting them out of offices to working at home. We were able to do a deep analysis by the demographics of our workforce. And then we decided that having launched that, we would continue tracking this throughout the whole of the pandemic. And that's what happened next. <laughs> and, and just to come in there just really, really quickly. I think this is the first time and last time I'm going to let Dawn introduce me and set me up as a glorious leader and be compared to, to, to North Korea. I think, I think, I think in terms of reason why it's so important in terms of pages to adapt, it was imagine putting yourself in the shoes of one of your employees. And if we just launched the standard sort of baseline engagement survey, we're asking employees questions about the career opportunities, um, questions about sort of feedback on their performance that would have felt so out of touch if the schools are shut down and they're concerned about their health and well-being and they want to make sure they've got the right kit working from home so i think what that allowed you to do was really to demonstrate to your workforce a lot of empathy and you weren't out of touch and i think that made a huge difference and that agility and and and, 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 and just make sure you ask the right questions Thank you. Uh, and this slide for everyone just shows the history of the collaboration between our organisations and the outcomes we got. Remember, the start point back in 2018 was 78% um, engagement on a 50, uh, 50 engagement on 78% turnout. And you can see here that that right the way through, um, we were tracking increasing levels of engagement and we were targeting and aiming at uh, higher levels of response rate. I mean, the, the peak in October around a sort of 82 percent response rate and 83 percent level of engagement was really quite extraordinary. And I, and I would say the mood music uh, here uh, with the slight ups and downs, both in response rates and also engagement index is around the fact that we were living through a tremendous period of, of uncertainty. And to an extent, the government marched us up the top of the hill and then marched us down again. Uh, on a couple of occasions, which inevitably had impacts on on how people were thinking and feeling. But what I was pleased to see as an HR director was um, that um, we uh, finished uh, uh, this period uh, in a much healthier state from the engagement point of view than we had done uh, uh, at the start. And you know, when you've got company values and they were literally things on the wall that nobody understood or used much, and you reach the end of this period and 97% understand those four values, respect, leadership, safety and integrity, and believe that leaders in the organisation own them and hold them true, and that they've been reflected in the way you've handled them through this unprecedented crisis. Um, well, that's something that I'm, I'm, very, I'm very proud of. And of course, what this doesn't show you is how we use this information internally to have conversations with senior leaders and their managers in turn around how and where they could and should be doing more. Each one of these surveys resulted in a different set of actions that we implemented around health and well-being uh, predominantly. And each one of these surveys uh, enabled my team and I to focus on some parts of our organisation that we may be more concerned about um, than others. And, and nothing is ever perfect. So, you know, for example, we pulled out here something from October 2020. Um, you know, we were unhappy with the level of concern about mental health and well-being, and we have still continued to try and put much more effort into making people feel two things, that there's an opportunity to develop and that there's an opportunity to not work excessively. Uh, an example of that opportunities for career development on our business scorecard this year at HS2, um, we have an org two organisational metrics, the number of internal promotions that take place, and the number of managed moves, uh, promotions that talent uh, moves that take place. And we established a target for the organisation as a whole. And, and my senior leaders are performance managed against that target, such that within the first six months of this year, we promoted 170 people and made 48 uh, managed moves happen. That's a response to the fact that our employees felt that 
um, we weren't focusing and concentrating enough on them. About our hearse as well, just to show. The sign of kind of you said uh, we did. Moving us on, thank you. And one of the biggest uh, benefits of the regular approach and the way we adapted and worked together with WorkBuzz was that in effect, we were able to get a thematic analysis right the way through from our people around how did they feel about the future of work when we were able to come back to working in our office environment. And that shaped the approach that we're now taking to opening up offices. I remember like some of your organisations, we had some of the tensions between white collar office staff not being in offices and blue collar uh, production or construction working staff being on sites and required to attend and having to work safely. So there was always that that tension. We've ended up in a world where the majority of our employees have told us right the way through that they would be comfortable with the degree of hybrid working, both office and home working. And we've ended up in a world where we're experimenting now with different designs in our office, different layouts and different working patterns. And we've ended up in a world where we've uh, rebuilt our flex working and home working policies. And we've ended up in a world where we've built the journey of the conversation that managers must have with people in our Oracle Fusion HR platform. So we are recording everything. He's a Man United. Engagement with people through our survey tools and also through other uh, forums, including our trade union and our workplace uh, forum. So it's been uh, really quite interesting, quite live uh, data that we've used to, to plan and manage uh, our response. Next slide, please. Um, and here's an example of how working with uh, work bars gets you into the data uh, and gets you a different level of, of, of insight. Um, so uh, we've worked collaboratively to deep dive into the demographic data. In, in this example, we see our gender data provides insights into the differences of how male and killers, Mr. Brightside, so well-being levels, their thoughts on authentic leadership, communications and career developments. And then in our lever data, we can see from our lever data the most cited reasons for leaving career recognition and work and the groups most likely to leave uh, HS2, white and Asian ethnic groups and those disclosed with, with a disability. So accessing this data at our fingertips tips in more or less real time not only supports our EDI strategy and our well-being agenda, but the future thinking of our entire employee engagement and experience programme, because it's telling us how and where we need to focus and what we need to, to focus on. This is intuitive information and insights creating the need to do things differently and collaborate uh, the, the proudest achievement um, beyond the kind of employee experience thing that this is clearly reflecting is that hs2 is now the first employer in the country to achieve clear assured platinum the word that our, uh, our um, uh, employees use about us most when they're asked to do a mind map of, of how they think about us is inclusive, which is a tremendous accolade. Clear Assure Platinum is a benchmark externally, uh, which suggests that, uh, that in HS2 inclusive thinking is built into our HR policies and not uh, bolted on. And I think that's a really good as a basis for two things, attracting and retaining new colleagues as we grow and keeping the existing colleagues that we have already. Next slide, please. And here's some evidence of the impact of what we've been uh, doing. And, I, and, and I'd like to say to you um, two things that uh, the first is, of course, we all believe, don't we, as HR professionals, that there's value in listening to the voices that employees have uh, and responding to their feedback, because intuitively we think that's a good thing to do. And we think it probably has some impact on retention or productivity or whatever. And uh, I just set out here to uh, to track it, uh, to make sure that we did have some data underpinning that uh, proposition. Um, and our data shows that since implementing an employee experience focused strategy, which is influenced and shaped by responding to the pandemic and influenced and shaped by work bars rather than rooted in the strategy that I set out four years ago, our staff retention rates have increased by approximately 9% compared to 2017. And my finance colleagues estimate that that's resulting in two to three million pounds a year of, of savings in what would otherwise have been workforce cost. So I think that's a pretty good return on investment for a relatively small sum of money to work with an organisation like 
work bars. Remember, these are calculations done by my colleagues in finance, not my colleagues in H in HR. And um, our employee brand in the marketplace is, of course, our reputation. And what people say about us um, is kind of out, out of our control. But the baseline survey results here suggest that 19% more staff would recommend us as a place to work now when compared to 2018. And I think that's testimony to the fact that during the pandemic, we've made every effort to focus our energy on people's well-being. And we provided the resources, um, line manager training, weekly well-being webinars, updated our intranet site, constantly promoted flexible working, introduced a concept of my time where people can take a break during the day, lots of things. And absenteeism is, is lower than it was uh, uh, too. So I think all of these things play a part in retaining staff and improving uh, how we are regarded. And I think they have uh, an important part to play in branding and reputation in the marketplace too. But it's good to put some some financial numbers around the good work that I think this reflects. Uh, perhaps some final thoughts next. I think this organisation is unrecognisable, and I think it's unrecognisable to 2017 because we set clear strategic direction, but we've demonstrated the ability to adapt and pivot to that direction to unforeseen events. Most of the challenges that everyone um, a really great supplier like uh, like uh, WorkBuzz. And actually, I think also because of the the bravery and commitment of my colleagues in, in HR, I have this and uh, this image or this analogy that I sometimes use when you're appointed HR director, um, it's like it's like acquiring a new property. You've obviously chosen to buy it and uh, you're happy to be there. And when you walk through the front door to take possession of the property, you've probably got in mind already um, what sort of refurbishment project is needed. And I feel that a lot of HR directors probably aren't given the time or the resources to do more than a Really, to start with, I'm going to put a fresh gloss of paint on the walls to hide up the worst of the interior decoration that was left by the by the by the previous owner. Um, they might even be doing a little structural repair on the basis that there's damp rot or or something needs knocking down and pulling apart, adding a room on something like that. They very rarely, we very rarely get the opportunity to contemplate pulling a building down and putting a different building up on the plot because we're not given the time and the money. Um, but here was an opportunity where, uh, for a variety of reasons, the uniqueness of the programme, the circumstances that I inherited, the, the things that we've confronted, here was an opportunity to be the architect of a new blueprint and to oversee the rebuilding of uh, the building and the rebuilding of the organisation. And I leave my successor, since I uh, retire from full-time corporate life in a couple of weeks' time, I leave my successor uh, with a completely different building on the plot and one that we can be much happier with than the building that I walked into four years ago. Uh, and thank goodness um, we've worked with WorkBus during that that time and a whole lot of other suppliers in other areas as well. But thank goodness we employed the right people to do the design and to help us do that build, because otherwise we wouldn't be in a good situation now. So that's that's my story. That's the story of working with WorkBus. I hope that helps. Um, some of you, uh, and if it doesn't, I can only apologise because it's my last ever go at talking to uh, an audience about my professional career as an HR director. So thank you. That's a plea for sympathy, by the way. <laughs> Over to you, Steve. Dawn. Oh, well, I think, Neil, thank you for such a candid overview. Uh, and I very often when I hear an accomplished sort of um, chief people officer present, normally you hear a choreographed story and so it's all mapped out from day one exactly the way and um, they it plans out around that and really appreciate that openness and honestly absolutely around what you inherited when you first joined and that sort of four hr directors in a year is never a good sign i think from my point of view working with you really closely i think there's two things you've done exceptionally well that other organizations people on, on, on this call could learn from i think the first thing is um, HS2 had an employee listening strategy. I think you had an annual survey, but it was run every two years um, in, uh, um, in the main, a bit of a tick box exercise. And I, I remember when we first started working with you and your colleagues, a lot of feedback around what was or what wasn't working. I think what you did really, really well was really map out your different internal stakeholder groups. 
And I, I think sort of I think the three groups for me that really stood out was around your executive team, around the hearts and minds around that sort of why is focus on focus on the employee experience really important? How is that going to link in terms of retaining great talents, um, employee reputation, and enable the strategy? Second group, I think you really focused on were your people managers and their role. I, I think in the past they'd seen HR as owning employee feedback and employee engagements. So how you educated and upskilled that population to take ownership of their own feedback and what they can influence. And the third group was sort of frontline employees who don't have any people management responsibilities. And I think one of the things you've done so well is by really focusing on those three different groups within our hearts and minds, you built a really strong foundation for employee voice. And that's why I think you've seen things like your server response rates improve and then off the back of that sort of perceptions around um sort of um the percentages that will recommend h as two as a great place to work so i think you did that really really well whereas a lot of organizations or clients we sometimes work with haven't built those foundations and therefore whatever they do in terms of employee voice is going to be less effective um uh, if they haven't done the hearts and minds piece and then follow that through with the return investment slides you just shared and having Finance do that so you're not doing the HR marketing your home homework. I think it's a really smart idea to really sort of um, demonstrate the ROI. I think the second thing I, I think you've done exceptionally well as as, as as a leadership team is acknowledging COVID is brand new, there's no playbook. So I think when, when I look at your CV, the amount of big HR jobs you've, you've had at huge organizations, a lot of challenges, imagine you, you see, you've got a playbook for you've seen before. Um, in the early stage of your career, whereas for all of us, COVID was brand new, a bit of a shock to the system, and even things like hybrid working, a lot of us are having to learn as we do. And I think what you've done really well from a leadership perspective is that authentic leadership. You've acknowledged there's no playbook. You've used employee feedback to help shape what does that look like at HS2, and then use that to get feedback on what is or isn't working. That's that approach. I think from my perspective having worked closely with you. I think that's two things other, other people in this call can, can learn from. One, the hearts and mind piece at the start, measuring term investment. And then secondly, um, using feedback to shape your, your approach to hybrid working and acknowledging there's no off the shelf to the playbook that you can just dust out from a, from a previous role before. Um, and, and clearly, you've done an amazing job, you and your team, moving the needle on lots of those items over the last, last two to three years. So that's my take. Thank you. They're really good reflections. And I think um, what I've loved about getting to know you, Neil, is just your story, really. And, and I think just as a an end ending question, um, as you poignantly said, you know, being the architect of such um, a great journey at HS2, what what has your time there meant to you as you move on? The real risk back in 2017 was that the program would be cancelled um, and there's still a risk that not all of it will eventually be built, but the program had been cancelled and therefore the legacy uh, that it represents wouldn't have been happen, wouldn't have happened. So I'm I'm really proud that there are 21,000 people working today and it will be 35,000 people who will be in work who might otherwise have not been. That, that's a collective achievement of our board of our executive team and my function and I have played a, a real part in making sure that outcome positively has has occurred. So that's the kind of the first the first answer. And the second answer is, um, you know, I come to work to um, to. I come to work where, where I'm attack, attracted to the purpose. I come to work where there's an opportunity to make a difference. I come to work where there's an opportunity to learn something. Uh, I come to work where there are people that I like and trust and respect to be with um, and I get paid too. So most of the last four years at HS2, even in the dark moments, that personal sense of what I'm about and how I do it has always helped me and it will do in whatever I choose to do to do next. And I, and I, and I think really the reflection on HS2 was I'm so glad that it gave me the opportunity to keep learning uh, and doing stuff. I'm so glad that I didn't just end up running a playbook in the way that Steve 
described it, I think that would have been very dull and quite boring and would have been a disservice to the organisation. So my encouragement to everyone listening is think about what it is that really turns you on about the world of work and make sure that when you're in the world of work, you're in the circumstances that enable you to give of and be your very best self every day. Because if you aren't in that situation, you're making somebody else's life more miserable than it needs to be. I love that. I think you've just encapsulated what a great employee experience is just there. <laughs> Being connected to purpose, feeling like you're part of something successful, feeling valued and appreciated, like you've made a difference. Um, and I think a lot of what you've just shared in terms of the story to win network and will improve your great employee experience has been like at HS2 as well. So we just wanted to say a massive thank you on behalf of Workbus really for joining us today, sharing your experiences. Um, and you know, enabling us to partner with you because we've loved every second of it too. Um, just to finish up, because we're literally wrapping close to the 45 minute mark, which is amazing timing guys, so thank you for that. Um, on offer today, we've got three 40 minute slots available for you to be able to talk to us about your own challenges and how they relate to Neil's experiences at HS2 and, and in your sector as well. So it's on a first come first serve basis. So if you're interested in learning more, just email us at hello at workbuzz.com and we'll be in touch. But as we said, we'll be sharing this recording afterwards. There's some really great research on our website as well. We've just launched our latest state of employee engagement research, which you can download from there, and also a really powerful ebook on um, four ways to build an inclusive culture. So some great resources available at workbuzz.com. Again, a massive thank you for joining us today. We'll be in touch with the recording and have a great rest of the week. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Dolph.